Welcome to Korea Global Forum for Peace 2022. This is session 1-2, Evaluation and Meeting of the 50th Anniversary of the July 4th Inter-Korean Joint Statement. We will now begin the session. I would like to make an announcement about the simultaneous interpretation that we provide throughout the session. Please use the receivers on your tables and set your set the channel on channel 3 for Korean and channel 4 for English. And also, we will have a Q&A session if you're joining us virtually you can click the Q&A link on YouTube, and this is streamed live on YouTube. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hong Yang Ho. I'm the moderator of Session 1-2. As mentioned, the title of the session is Evaluation and Meaning of the 50th Anniversary of the July 4th Inter-Korean Joint Statement. I will now introduce the presenters and discussants. We are Choi bo Sun of Kangwon National University. Mr. Che graduated from SNU with a degree in political science and received a master's degree in political science from Lehi University in the U.S. and a doctorate in North Korean studies from the University of North Korean Studies. He also started his career at the Ministry of Culture and Public Information and served in various positions in the government. Uh, we'll now um, introduce Mr. Che. I just introduced Mr. Che. Now, uh, we'll move on to the next presenter, Mr. Park. He is an invitation research fellow at Korea Institute for National Unification and director of Korea Peace Foundation. In fact, Dr. Park, back in 1983, when I joined the Land and Unification Agency, he was my colleague. And then he went to the U.S. to study and received a Ph.D. in politics in Cincinnati. And then he joined the Korea Peace Foundation as a senior fellow to study the wide areas of um, studies uh, in North Korea. And as mentioned, he's an invitation research fellow at Korea Institute for National Unification. And prior to joining Kinu, he was also a researcher at the Korea Institute for Defense Analysis, and he was also a fellow with Hudson Institute from 1998 to 2008. So that was Dr. Park. Now moving on to the discussants, we have with us uh, Dr. Lee chang -yeol. At the Ministry of Unification, he built his career, especially when it comes to inter-Korean summit and issues about North Korea. He developed policies toward North Korea. And he also served various positions. And he received his PhD in Chinese studies. And he served as a unification officer of the Korean embassy in China, and he analyzed China's strategy on the Korean peninsula back then. So welcome, Mr. Lee. Next, we have Director Kim Chung-hwan, who is director of the Institute for Korean Integration of Society. He has also been working for the Institute for Inter-Korean Integration of Society for a long time, and is also a director of the Council on Diplomacy for Korea Unification. And he has been working in activities for inter-Korean social integration and national unification since 2020. 
Now we have uh, with us uh, Mr. Lee Kang Woo. He is a researcher for South North Economic Cooperation at the Institute for Korean Integration of Society. And for 29 years, he worked for the Ministry of Unification and retired in 2020. He now gives lectures and also studies on North Korea. Last but not least, we have with us the only foreign speaker, discussant. We have Professor Wilson. And Dr. Wilson is a professor at Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University, Korea. He studies Asia Peace and Conflict Resolution, and he provides consulting in those fields. And he received his master's in Indiana State University and doctorate in conflict analysis and resolution from George Mason University. Please welcome Professor Wilson. He speaks Korean, actually. However, today he will discuss in English. Please use the receivers when Professor Wilson discusses in English. Now, some housekeeping announcements. We will have this session until 12.30, so I will give about uh, 20 to 25 minutes um, to the presenters and 7 to 8 minutes to each discussant. And after the round of um, the first round of presentation and discussion, then we will receive questions from the floor or from the online participants. You can ask questions anytime, and we will make sure to entertain those questions during the Q and A session. Now, without further ado, uh, we will begin session 1-2. First and foremost, we will hear from Professor Chet. As introduced, I am Che bo -sung. It's a great honor for me to join you in this session as a panelist and to look back on the July 4th South North Joint Statement. It's uh, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the statement, and I'm very thankful that I have this opportunity to evaluate the statement and also take a look at its implications. So I want to take a look at the July 4th South-North Joint Statement uh, from today's perspective, as I said, as of today. As I mentioned earlier, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the statement, and uh, looking back, it was actually very groundbreaking in terms of format and in terms of the provisions included in this statement. At the time, the Cold War was raging on, and the Korean Peninsula was at the center of the Cold War dynamics, and uh, the fact that there were high-level exchanges between the two Koreas. Of course, uh, the dialogue was carried out in an indirect manner through proxies, uh, but the fact that uh, this dialogue occurred, uh, this high-level dialogue occurred even indirectly, was uh, quite uh, groundbreaking. And the fact that they engaged in this sort of indirect dialogue to gauge each other's intentions was uh, very groundbreaking as well. I'm sure you are aware that there are seven agreed provisions, and even if you look at these provisions from today's perspective, they are groundbreaking, and the provisions are still remain key challenges uh, for inter-Korean uh, relations uh, to this day. And so I think we need to acknowledge that this statement was groundbreaking in terms of format and in terms of content. But today, uh, it is uh, not 
uh, does not gain uh, that much uh, attention. But I think that uh, we need to take a look at this statement to take stock of inter-Korean relations uh, today. And I think it's meaningful to do so to look ahead uh, in inter-Korean uh, relations as well. Of course, during the past uh, 50 years, numerous uh, uh, researchers, numerous academics uh, have uh, thoroughly analyzed and carried out comparative studies uh, based on this topic. So I'm sure some of you uh, think that there is really no nothing new to shed light on when it comes to the uh, July 4th uh, joint statement. But I think that uh, perhaps uh, we can still gain some intuition or some insight that still remains when we uh, try to look at this uh, statement from a fresh point of view, from today's point of view. I shared my presentation earlier, and uh, there are 20 pages uh, to my slide. So I'm going to keep it short and uh, focus my comments on the evaluation and also its uh, implications. So I think I have some uh, positive uh, feedback when it comes to the evaluation, and the implications uh, would be uh, lessons that need to be learned. Uh, the clicker needs to work. Uh, I think there's a page missing from my deck here. I'm sure that uh, you have the presentation material so with you. I brought some new uh, material today. I'm sure that uh, the text, uh, the uh, missing slide, uh, is included in the uh, material, the presentation material, in the booklet. I'm sure that you've heard this before, but the July 4th uh, North-South Joint Statement was the first agreed uh, document by the two Koreas uh, since the Korean War. And the purpose uh, was uh, for the two Koreas uh, to express their willingness and yearning for uh, unification. So this was in line uh, with the uh, will and desire for unification of the people. And if you look at the content, uh, there was no slander, and uh, it also included statements of refraining from the use of force. And so it dealt with the very imminent and important issues uh, that the two Koreas had to pan out at the time. And so in terms of content and in terms of substantial provisions, you can say that uh, it is a solid statement. In 1948, after the two Koreas were born, objectively speaking, both Koreas uh, were not success, uh, successful at nation building. And so we were not able to build the nation as Western countries did over a period of 200 and 300 years. Uh, the two Koreas did not have a process of uh, building national identity. Uh, nation state is when uh, the people of that country come together to uh, protect and guard uh, uh, territorial sovereignty and when they share a national identity. And uh, even today, some may dispute this, but we still live in a world of uh, nation states. And uh, going through the Korean War, uh, the two Koreas, having gone through the Korean War, were able to build their nation. And uh, the statement acknowledged the existence of two nation states on the Korean Peninsula. And even though that was the reality before the agreement, uh, the two Koreas, uh, of course, uh, 
denied each other's legitimacy, but uh, since uh, the joint statement, uh, they acknowledged that there was, in fact, uh, two nation states uh, on the Korean Peninsula, and uh, they acknowledged the inevitable uh, inevitability of uh, doing that in order to move forward with uh, unification issues. The Korean War was actually not a civil war, but it was an international war. So, no one party could unify the Korean Peninsula by the use of force, and this was proven. So, the two sides acknowledge the nature of the situation, and they expressed a willingness to acknowledge the limitations of a military confrontation. And they acknowledged that uh, the two countries would be in a broader uh, competition uh, mode, if you will. And so I believe that the statement was significant in acknowledging uh, these uh, different elements. And uh, now I would like to talk about the significance uh, of the statement in South Korea. As I mentioned earlier, before the statement, South and North Korea denied each other's legitimacy. And so uh, the unification issue was a policy issue. And so uh, unification issues were the exclusive domain of the government and of the regime uh, in North Korea. Uh, however, with the signing of the July 4th uh, North-South uh, 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 joint statement, uh, in the two Koreas, people were given the opportunity to discuss unification issues openly uh, within legal boundaries. And in South Korea, unification issues uh, became open to diverse opinions and also competing opinions, and that is the significance of the statement in South Korea. And although I will mention it uh, later on, the July 4th statement promoted discussion on unification issues in civil society, and it also made South Korea realize to need the need to change the perception regarding North Korea policies to pursue more realistic goals. If you look at uh, many papers and interviews, South Korean officials uh, tried very hard to uh, deny the existence of North Korea, and so they were very defensive in the entire process. Uh, at the time, uh, the anti-communist policy of uh, South Korea uh, was centered on the denial of the legitimacy of North Korea. So in the entire process, South Korea uh, had to remain uh, very defensive. But with the signing of the joint uh, agreement, uh, South Korean government was able to free itself from the burden of having to constantly deny uh, North Korean regime and uh, take a more realistic, uh, practical approach. And this allowed South Korean government to be a little bit more active uh, in uh, its dealings with North Korea. I'm noticing that all the even-numbered pages of my deck are missing. So I have a third slide regarding the evaluation of the joint statement. I think also uh, this is uh, sort of linked to the uh, first point that I made, but I think that the statement itself uh, made all parties really realize uh, the essence, the fundamental issues of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, the two Koreas realized uh, that uh, the issue is interlinked with neighboring powers, that uh, it is uh, very difficult to resolve this issue with uh, the two parties alone. At the time of uh, the agreement, 
There was a detente in countries nearby. Uh, the U.S. was making overtures uh, to China. And so uh, the statement was influenced uh, by uh, this uh, sort of trend that was being created uh, by uh, the hegemonic powers. These uh, superpowers uh, have their own agenda, and uh, sometimes uh, peninsular issues and other issues in the region uh, are not central to them or are not prioritized all the time. And uh, the two Koreas realized this uh, at the time, and this made them realize that uh, peninsular issues perhaps cannot be resolved uh, solely uh, by the will and actions of uh, the two Koreas. Uh, despite the fact North and South Korean officials at the time tried to make space where the two parties could take the initiative. Uh, they made an effort, they made a policy effort to make uh, issues on the Korean Peninsula uh, about uh, North and South Korea. As I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, there was a mood of uh, detente, and uh, some of the neighboring countries, some of the bigger powers, encouraged uh, South and uh, North Korea to create the space, and uh, North and South Korea did have the option of turning a blind eye, but they did not, and they actively tried to create a space uh, where uh, they could take uh, the initiative and discuss uh, unification issues. Um, and if you look at the current status, my slide deck. So if we were to objectively look at the joint statement, it does not enjoy the status that it did uh, for a very long time. Uh, for instance, now uh, it does not uh, have uh, or enjoy the same standing as the June 15th uh, declaration. Uh, however, for North Korea, uh, the principles of unification uh, is something that it keeps going back to, and South Korea cannot deny this. So it does still have meaning. Uh, during Kim Dae-jung uh, administration, the June 15th declaration was announced, and this uh, was a declaration uh, as an outcome of a direct dialogue uh, between the two leaders of Korea. So I have to say, since uh, the June 15th declaration, uh, the status of of the July uh, 4th statement diminished uh, somewhat. And so whenever we talk about uh, inter-Korean relation, uh, we uh, tend to talk about the inter-Korean uh, basic agreement. And up until the inter-Korean basic agreement, we still quoted uh, the July statement because the basic agreement does uh, explicitly uh, state uh, the joint statement in name. Uh, but now, uh, not so much. It is no longer the ultimate benchmark uh, when it comes to inter uh, Korean dialogue and inter-Korean dealings. And of course, I think it's a sort of a natural course. And uh, North Korea ha now is more uh, on the uh, defensive rather than the offensive. And uh, perhaps this is also a reflection of that. Now I want to talk about the limitations of uh, the statement. All experts tend to look back and understand and carry out analysis. 
and uh, researchers rarely have the opportunity to do this uh, uh, before an agreement or before an incident or event. We tend to look back and uh, analyze uh, what has uh, been done. So the limitations and the implications that I'm mentioning right now is uh, insight we've gained uh, 50 years on. So I want to say that this is something that we need to take into consideration uh, when uh, we look at the limitations and implications. Uh, I think one of the first limitations of the July 4th uh, statement was uh, that after the statement to North and South Korean officials, whenever they hold a meeting, they feel that they have to come up with an agreement. Uh, the July 4th the statement was signed for a greater cause and uh, for instance uh, South Korea at the time was concerned of a breakdown in talks and South Korea proceeded to agree on principles uh, with North Korea which is considered off limits in negotiations uh, with communists. So we begin with principles and the interpretation is carried out differently by the two parties. Uh, this is something that South Korean officials at the time wanted to avoid, but they had to accept this because they wanted an agreement. And uh, this led to North Korea uh, interpreting uh, principles uh, and the statement uh, differently, and they end up doing what they want. So this is uh, uh, something uh, that we can consider uh, a, a limitation. And sometimes uh, the negotiators, because uh, they want an agreement, because they want to hammer out an agreement, they agree to provisions they know uh, are not going to be able to implement. So uh, uh, officials are fully aware that some provisions may not be implemented in the future, uh, but they still uh, agree to it or they agree to certain actions in a very ambiguous way so that the agreement can be made. Uh, but then after the agreements are made, the uh, provisions are not implemented and uh, interpretations are done differently, and uh, this uh, continues on. And this uh, happened in many incidences, in many uh, agreements and statements that followed the July 4th statement. If you look at the uh, Geneva Agreed Framework, of course, this is more like a uh, contract. If you look at legal documents, there you have a definition of the terminology. And uh, the two Koreas also uh, need to clarify uh, some of the terminology they use. If they had done this uh, with the July 4th uh, statement, I think that that would have sent a precedent and it would not have come to the situation where we come up uh, with an agreement, but in the agreement there are very ambiguous uh, uh, provisions and the terminology is not clear, so the implementation uh, goes awry. And uh, the second limitation, I have to say, uh, is uh, the secrecy that is involved. If you look at the July 4th statement, at the time, uh, there was a, officially an open uh, meeting that was going on. And when these uh, meetings uh, or were not conducted smoothly, they began the uh, secret negotiations. And the secret negotiations led to the July 4th statement. And I think that was a very uh, bad precedent, uh, in my opinion. Uh, we live in a free and democratic society. And uh, of course, in a democratic society, uh, government officials uh, are uh, given a uh, proxy to uh, uphold the will of the people, but uh, it, this does not mean that uh, they can get away with anything. Uh, we need clear policies uh, and we, the need to guarantee the people's right to know. And secrecy goes against all these core values of democracy. Uh, 
the secrecy tends to be in place uh, for uh, performance and outcome. Of course, there are times uh, when secrecy is needed. Uh, closed or secret negotiations should be strictly limited to cases when the counterpart is unclear or the political risk is uh, too high. So there are certain cases when you need uh, secret negotiations for a breakthrough, but they must be held in strictly limited uh, scenarios. Uh, if not, uh, these negotiations should be pursued openly, uh, guaranteeing the people's right to know. And this is what a mature uh, democracy looks like. So if you look at the Korean society, we have uh, come so far with industrialization and digitalization, but still uh, we see a lot of uh, secrecy when it comes to uh, these negotiations. And of course, uh, since the 80s, uh, we have seen uh, more uh, openness, but under conservative uh, governments, uh, they are more open, and progressive governments are more closed. And this is because the government officials uh, are very wary of the outcome, and they want uh, uh, performance and results. And if you look at uh, the past, uh, a lot, in a lot of cases, intelligence bodies used to take center seat in the negotiations. And uh, the July 4th statement left a legacy of making intelligence bodies uh, take center stage in negotiations. And uh, this is problematic because it lacks representation and it's difficult for these parties uh, to see implementation so these are some elements uh, that we need to overcome. And the secrecy that uh, we hold on to is sometimes taken advantage of by uh, North Korea. Also, the July 4th statement came at a time when there was a, a, a lack of uh, internal organization. Of course, uh, you need uh, to keep secret um, classified information, but other than that, uh, the people need uh, to be in the know. They need to know uh, what the government uh, is uh, planning, what direction it's going to, or it's, uh, this is uh, what we're striving for. Uh, the people need uh, to know the broader framework. And uh, this is a way to get the people to participate and understand, but the July 4th statement came without this uh, process. So there was a lack of uh, internal consensus. Uh, the working level officials later in interviews uh, stated that um, the secrecy was an issue because the people could not understand uh, uh, this uh, statement because just a couple of days ago, uh, the South Korean government was pointing fingers at North Korea as an enemy. That is why um, they could not call uh, this an uh, agreement. They had to call it the North-South uh, uh, Joint uh, Statement, and uh, they could not use uh, the explicit names and position and titles of the participants. And so uh, when these agreements are made, it is essential to have uh, and build an internal consensus. Uh, however, um, the statement uh, was uh, sort of hammered out as a surprise, and uh, there was a lot of uh, secrecy involved. And now I want to look at uh, the uh, last limitation. And the last limitation is that uh, the two sides uh, wanted uh, something complete. They wanted uh, this uh, statement uh, to cover all issues and be complete. Uh, the two Koreas had uh, conflicting unification policies, uh, they had different political goals, and they had a different vision, but this is something that you cannot really agree upon. 
So what it came to is that uh, the officials would focus on imminent issues uh, that they can reach an agreement on, and these would be included as provisions in the statement. Uh, but if there was uh, more work and broader uh, sort of framework, that would have helped. I think the same goes for the June 15th uh, declaration and all the other statements. They tried to do everything. They tried to agree on the mission and the vision and all the specific provisions as well. So I think that we need to do away with trying to agree on uh, different values and different systems. Uh, and rather, we need to focus on uh, issues at hand that uh, we can work together on and we can agree on. And uh, perhaps uh, we can start small and uh, build uh, bigger. And I think the July 4th statement was the beginning of this sort of way of uh, coming to an agreement. Thank you very much, Dr. Che. Uh, he talked about the implications uh, of uh, the July 4th statement and also the uh, limitations. Uh, next, I would like to invite Dr. Park Yong Ho, and he will be giving a uh, presentation on the 50th anniversary of the statement and the uh, paradigm shift of uh, inter Korean relations. So, Mr. Park will focus his presentation on the statement and also assess the inter Korean relations so far and predict the future. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. As introduced, so Mr. Hong was actually the former vice minister of the Ministry of Unification, and it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, well, here we have colleagues from the ministry. And from 1980s, um, before I went to the States to study, I worked with Mr. Hong. Mr. Hong joined the ministry back then, and we did not have the opportunity to work for a long time in the ministry, but as a researcher and officials of the ministry, we were able to interact and provide advising to the president and the Blue House. So we have been maintaining our relationship. And today, I uh, will talk about the 50th anniversary of the statement. Since Dr. Che assessed the statement itself, well, back in 72, um, I was in high school. And I remember it was a very hot summer. I was prepping for university, and I saw the statement being signed on the news. And at the time, I did not understand the implication of the statement. As a member of Korea, well, I remembered the pain that the two Koreas endured uh, during the Korean War, and it felt like we were going to a new direction. And, but since then, it's been 50 years, and now we have a lot to reflect upon. And we did have some failures as well. Of course, I do believe that those who were involved in the statement worked very hard to make this work. However, while so, I would like to say that I'm not here to belittle the statement. But it's been 50 years since the signing of the statement, and still the inter-Korean relations are not that positive. Well, at the time, well, the statement said that North and South Korea solemnly promised to keep the statement. However, were we able to do so, we need to reflect on our commitment. So I will briefly talk about that and talk about a new paradigm shift in inter-Korean relations going forward. 
As you can see on the slide, this is um, the signing of the statement. And uh, the South-North Coordinating Committee was kicked off. However, it did not work that well. And for the past half a century, sometimes the inter-Korean relations improved, sometimes it soured. So we need to look back and stay cool-headed. And the same goes for the recent agreement. It says before the 80 million people, we solemnly swear to stay fully committed However, since then, North Korea blew up the liaison office and they verbally attacked South Korea and the president. And if you look at the July 4th South-North joint statement, it talks about not verbally attacking or defaming each other. However, those were empty words. I think that something's wrong with the slides. I'm not seeing some of the slides. But anyways, um, I would like to briefly talk about the problem statement. It's been 50 years since the signing of the statement. What happened to the commitments? And if it failed, what was the reason behind the failure? What do we need to do going forward? If you look at the statement, as I mentioned, it's been 50 years since the signing of the statement. The two Koreas agreed to the provisions, and it sends a very positive note. However, well, this was signed on July 4th, 1972, but on July 11th, the two Germanys also signed the Basic Treaty. If you look at the Basic Treaty between GDR and FRG, they accept differences. And when it comes to unification issues, they accept the differing views on national issues, and they recognize each other as sovereign states. And it states that the treaty is guided by the purposes and principles embodied in the UN Charter, such as respect for independence, autonomy, territorial integrity, the preservation of human rights, and so on. So it starts with the UN Charter, and they recognized each other as sovereign states. And FRG and GDR accepted that they were two different states. But Within FRG, they received criticism about giving up their sovereignty, but with the ruling of the Constitutional Court of GDR, it emphasized that the basic treaty did not conflict with the constitutional goals of unification. And then the two Germanys launched the resident representative office and they signed cultural agreements and developed both countries. But if you look at the Korean statement, of course, they talk about exchanges and correspondence. And those are included in the statement. However, no mutual exchanges were made. They do not correspond with one another. So in that sense, we cannot say that 
we were able to solve the problem of unification. We relied on the emotional logic only, not about national development or national growth, but it was about self-satisfaction. And after the July statement, as you know, Yushin um, system was adopted in Korea and Kim Il-sungism in the DPRK and that became the only guiding ideology. So those were uh, the results of the statement. So to criticize the statement, um, both Koreas used the statement politically. Now, 50 years have passed. Korea is a DAC member country of OECD and joined the ranks of advanced countries. So Korea can be called an advanced country and 50-30 and Korea became the seventh country to achieve 30,000 per capita GDP with 50 million population and Korea has the status of full democracy by EIU. What about the DPRK? It's one of the poorest countries and worst human rights abuser. 55% are subject to extreme poverty and other than nine countries in Africa, one country in Asia, which is the DPRK, is the poorest country around the world. So you can see the huge difference between the two Koreas. What happened? Now, with the July 4th joint statement, in 1991, the Inter-Korean Basic Agreement came out, and it went into effect in 1992. In the late 1980s, uh, there was the Seoul Olympics in Seoul, and since then, Korea um, developed and achieved economic growth. If you look at the numbers, the July 4th statement, the Inter-Korean Basic Agreement, the October 4th Declaration, the Pyongyang Declaration, the June 15th North-South uh, Joint Declaration are some of the agreements that were signed since 1972, and the number of inter-Korean talks is huge as well. However, uh, we are still divided. So after 30 years since the signing of the statement, well, in 25 years, um, we will mark the 100th anniversary of the division. So what we are saying is to develop a new plan for the next 30 years. But we have been taking fragmented approaches so far. So during the previous administration, um, the president talked about achieving a new goal for inter-Korean relations. However, that did not happen. I'm not here to belittle um, the efforts that were made, and the short-term strategies that were made. However, now, looking back of the past 50 years, we need to be sober and to assess the achievements that we have made so far. So since the Inter-Korean Basic Agreement, uh, we had Kumgang Mountain uh, tourism programs, 
and the Kaesong complex opening. And the Ministry of Unification said that 20 million people visited Gumgang Mountain, but then out of the 20 million, how many people do you think actually met North Koreans? So we talk about inter-Korean exchanges and the Gumgang Mountain tour. Uh, was a part of such initiative. However, were we able to meet our goals? So South Koreans were only able to visit restricted areas. So it's not even, um, it cannot be called tourism. And I've been there. I'm sure that most of you have been there. And other than that, out of the uh, tourists, how many do you think um, paid out of their pockets? No. That was the taxpayer's money. What does that mean? So to promote inter-Korean exchanges, the Ministry of Unification and relevant organizations worked really hard. But then looking back, the Kaesong Industrial Complex, which used a lot of labor, it was just the means to earn foreign currency. So that's one of the criticisms. I apologize for saying this, but while the companies that are in Kaesong Industrial Complex, they are not top companies. So Korea is one of the 10th largest economy and to change the DPRK, we promoted inter-Korean programs, but as Mr. Che mentioned, when he assessed the statement, well, the intentions were good. However, when it comes to inter-Korean relations, dialogue and talks, well, sometimes we tend to be complacent and to take it for granted. We tend to think that having dialogue is enough for inter-Korean relations. And at one point, when you look back, then you have achieved nothing. So we've had many talks and agreements, but this is the reality. North Korea blew up the liaison office in 2020. And they're going back. What about the durability of the DPRK regime? To assess and to think about what we should do going forward, we need to evaluate how durable the regime is. So if you look at this, so I think we are missing that slide, but Anyway, many people thought that um, North Korea will become a democracy. However, after the Cold War and the invasion of Russia, what we are seeing is the opposite. With the advent of the 2000s, we see a two-block world. And 70% of the population globally uh, live in autocracies. That includes Russia and China and the DPRK. So China and Russia that are forging alliance recently are strong autocracies, autocracies. So, uh, North Korea has a very rigid regime and it is maintaining such a system and regime. However, um, because I'm pressed for time, I won't go into details. Uh, so, 
If you look at the different factors that assess the durability of the DPRK regime, we have to um, really look into these factors when formulating our policy toward North Korea, because most of the factors are in favor of the DPRK. Sometimes we tend to misinterpret the current status and we tend to think that engagement is enough. But if North Korea fails to uh, fulfill its commitment, we have to punish the regime. However, um, we think that unconditional engagement is engagement, which is wrong. So we have to redefine our terminology and concept. And the approaches to unification is different if you look at the two Koreas. North Korea focuses on Kim Il-sung-ism, and liberal democracy, market economy, human rights, and fundamental rights are the guiding principle of South Korea. So we have a huge gap. We need to be honest here. Before the DPRK changes its regime, do you think that the free, liberal, democracy-based unification will be possible between the two Koreas? No. So North Korea needs to change first. So the DPRK and South Korea, the Republic of Korea, we need to create an atmosphere where the two Koreas can peacefully coexist first and then North Korea needs to change, and we need to induce such change. And after we do that, then, just like East Germany, we have to encourage North Korea to choose a liberal democracy. And only when they make the decision on their own, then, they will come out. We cannot expect the DPRK to change its regime on its own. So in the process of going into democracy, Korea can help, and by doing so, we can change the paradigm, we can shift the paradigm. Uh, please uh, refer to my PowerPoint deck for further details. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Park, for that presentation. Now, before we move on to the discussion, I would like to briefly summarize the presentation. So the statement, given the international background or the internal uh, situation was groundbreaking, and it marked a shift of the policy. And it was a landmark statement in that sense. However, in the process of signing the statement, um, there were some limitations and implications. Secrecy was one of them. Um, we were not fully prepared for the statement. And the statement marked the beginning of uh, many different frameworks and dialogue. However, to genuinely grow inter-Korean relations, um, it was not enough. It did not contribute much. Especially, uh, Mr. Park talked about the need for the DPRK to change, to bring significant um, improvement of the inter-Korean relations. So that was his message, and he did not present about this, but 
Denuclearization is a must for the two Koreas um, to achieve unification. Now, uh, we heard from the two presenters. Uh, we will now hear from the discussants. We are pressed for time. We are behind the schedule. So I would like to ask the discussants um, to speak for about four minutes each. And after um, we go one round, we will receive questions. First, Mr. Lee. Yeah. I will try to keep it short. The July 4th statement was the foundation for unification uh, strategy. If you look at the provisions in the statement, North Korea uh, made a foundation to create a vacancy of power in the other party. In other words, uh, they prevented uh, foreign influence, uh, they highlighted um, unity of the people. So from North Korea's perspective, uh, they really had nothing to lose from the statement. So they were really the winners of the statement uh, from my perspective. And I believe South Korea was a bit uh, weak in the negotiation. And uh, I think during the July 4th statement process, North Korea was actually a little bit stronger uh, than South Korea. And that is why they could push ahead with the statement. But now the situation has changed, but yet South Korea still has difficulty uh, pushing ahead with provisions uh, when it comes to negotiations. Uh, North Korea fully takes advantage of its allies, and South Korea cannot of uh, the US. And so uh, South Korea, you can see from this uh, history uh, really has difficulty in uh, pushing with uh, pressure. And towards the end of the 60s, uh, North Korea engaged in a lot of serious uh, provocations. And uh, afterwards, uh, they came out to talk. They came to the dialogue table. Why did they do that? Uh, they did that because uh, at the time, US and China was engaged in detente. And whilst uh, that period was a peaceful time, uh, US was a strong hegemony. So what does that mean to us? We need to take a look at uh, the US-China relations right now. And we also need to take a look at how long US leaders leadership uh, will be valid uh, in the future. Uh, I have been studying China for uh, several years. I think China is uh, currently uh, weak, and that is why North Korea is a little vulnerable as well. So North Korea used China during the July 4th statement. So I believe that we need to take advantage of the US now uh, to uh, take advantage of uh, the situation. And there's a saying in China that a soldier is not afraid of uh, lying. Uh, what I want to say is that South Korea pursues these negotiations and they depend too much on the goodwill of North Korea. And I think the same goes for the July 4th statement. Uh, North Korea uh, simply walked out because uh, they wanted a withdrawal of U.S. forces and they just simply walked out of the talks. But South Korea tends to lean on and expect uh, goodwill uh, from North Korea. But North Korea is a communist state and they have an unwavering goal. And I think that South Korea also needs to be more patient. I think that South Korea has problems exerting more influence and power because uh, we are not patient. Uh, North Korea is a socialist. It's a communist state. Uh, they have nothing to hurry, whereas South Korea, the people in power, for the president, for example, is in power for only five years. And so South Korea needs to be patient. And I think that the government needs to be patient, and also the people need to be patient. And that is the only way we can have consistent 
consistent North Korea policy. When I was in China, I met a Chinese uh, scholar said, uh, he said that it did not matter whether was someone was conservative or progressive, the government was progressive or conservative, doesn't matter. It, what matters is having uh, policies that last at least a decade. So the socialist state, uh, they can afford all the time they want. They are in no hurry. And so we need to keep this in mind when we engage in dialogue. As mentioned, uh, we are marking the 50th anniversary of uh, this statement. And uh, it's been 50 years, and we're still dealing with the same issues. And this is probably possible because North Korea has all the time in the world. Next, uh, Dr. Kim chung Han. <coughs> Yes, thank you very much, Professor Che and Dr. Park, for the presentations. While I have um, nothing to add, your presentations were great, but I would still like to briefly uh, give my comment about the 50th anniversary of the joint statement the lessons that we need to learn and uh, my personal feelings and impression. Well, first about the significance of the 50th anniversary of the statement. I think it signals a paradigm shift of the inter-Korean relations. What I mean by that is this. Um, the peace initiative was laid out on August 5th of 1970, which talked about the good world competition between the two Koreas, the fair competition between the two. And uh, it marked a shift from no dialogue to dialogue. And the focus was to increase national power based on economic power. At the time, we had to ease tensions. We had to understand the hidden agenda of the DPRK um, because of their military power. So we wanted to understand what was going on. At the same time, the surroundings changed and shifted to detente, and that was the international landscape back then. And the joint statement was a top-down statement. High-level officials exchanged secret letters and they talked behind closed doors and they engaged in multiple rounds of meetings. And humanitarian aid was an agenda that was discussed during the meetings. If you look at the agenda, you can see that the joint statement tells us a lot about how the two Koreas regarded the statement. Since then, in economic and cultural fronts, we have been conducting and carrying out different initiatives to gain the upper hand. And since then, the two Koreas engaged in the power struggle. And there was some agreement on the process, which marked the beginning of the following talks. And I think it gave the way to more talks and dialogue. And as a result, in the 70s, we had different talks about um, on the sports and other areas as well. So the two Koreas wanted to lead the unification process and they talked about the recovery of one people identity and that was one of the underlying principles. 
If you look at the inter-Korean basic agreement and the July 4th statement, they, as well as the Korea summit declaration and so on, well, the following statements and agreements all based on the July 4th statement. But this goal of unification, it feels like we remain fixated on the goal only. What I mean by that is that when it comes to unification, it must involve uh, multiple rounds of tedious negotiations. So it's not just about the end, but the means matter. But the July 4th statement failed to drive the following processes. It remained as an end only. So, the two Koreas began to focus on their internal affairs. So, the lesson that we can learn from this statement is as follows. As we walk towards unification, the July 4th statement was a landmark event that signaled the transition of the inter-Korean relations. And we need to come up with another turnaround point. And we must pursue a friendly unification process. Now, if the division is permanent, that will mean permanent pain for the people of the two Koreas. So we need to grow the economy, achieve democracy, and also reconstruct a state going forward. And human rights, liberal democracy, as well as other core values should be the guiding principle. And at the same time, we need to set realistic goals the action plans, and the tasks going forward. And so the unification plan should involve detailed steps. And to achieve unification, we need to create an atmosphere that is friendly to unification. And that must be top priority. We also need to reach consensus among the people. And under a grand plan, we need to come up with action plans. At the same time, we need to engage more people. And we need to share the results of the initiatives that we take and receive feedback from the people. And we also need to scale out the programs as we move forward. And I believe that is key. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Lee Gang-woo. Uh, uh, I would like to thank the two presenters for their presentations on the 50th anniversary of the July 4th Statement. I would also like to talk about a couple of implications of uh, the statement. Uh, when the statement was signed, and even today, I think uh, we are faced with a geopolitical transition. So today, I think, as we prepare for the great transition, uh, we need an agreement uh, with uh, North Korea, just as we did uh, back then. 
And no matter what we agree on, and no matter what type of uh, North Korea policy, and uh, no matter what the relations, I think we need to move beyond declaratory statements. Uh, we need uh, uh, something that we can uh, implement. We need to use uh, what we have uh, to focus on issues that can actually be implemented. Uh, we need to take a more substantial and practical view and in this sense, uh, Dr. Park uh, mentioned normalization of inter-Korean relations, and he also gave us some policy direction forward. And uh, I think that this is something that we need to discuss further, and I would like to raise three points to that end. Uh, first is that uh, the inter-Korean relations has changed completely compared to what it was in the past. And I think it changes with the changing environment. So we need to establish new relations based on this changing environment. The fact of the matter is uh, North Korea has a, a nuclear program. It has nuclear weapons. So we need uh, to change the way we deal with North Korea. And also, the inter-Korean relations itself has become a global issue because of North Korea nuclear program, uh, we need to think about where we can take initiative. In uh, 2018, uh, President Moon met with uh, Kim Jong-un, and they held a historic uh, summit. They held it three times. Uh, but if you look at what was agreed upon at the time, uh, there were provisions regarding linking the inter-Korean railway. Uh, there were provisions uh, about agreeing on a uh, new uh, Mount Sukumgang project. But none of these uh, have made any uh, steps uh, forward. So what does this mean? It means uh, that even inter-Korean agreements uh, need uh, international cooperation and international support. I think that this is the reality we need to accept uh, uh, in uh, signing agreements uh, with uh, North Korea. We need to uh, agree on what can be implemented, and we need to come up with a system where we can follow up on uh, what we have agreed upon. And uh, by following up, uh, we need to be able to make uh, necessary changes to make implementation possible. So we can't just do away with provisions and agreements because uh, implementation uh, has not been made. We need to reflect to reality to the agreement so that they uh, can be implemented. And uh, secondly, uh, inter-Korean relations are now more than ever influenced uh, by uh, the international community. And we also need to think about whether we can restore inter-Korean relations to uh, what it was before. I think not. Uh, I think our ties have been uh, severed quite significantly. If you look at what is coming out of North Korea, uh, they're saying that let's just just uh, be indifferent. Let's not be involved anymore. Uh, North Korea is confident that it can be a, a nuclear state. It's going its own way. So I think when we look at inter-Korean relations, we need a fresh set of eyes. Uh, I don't think we can restore the relation to what it was. I think we need to keep in mind that we are entering a period where uh, the relation is uh, severed and the separation is becoming solidified. Uh, as long as the armistice is there, I think that it's inevitable. Uh, the essence of the matter is that inter-Korean relations are irregular and abnormal because uh, the separation itself is abnormal and irregular. Uh, if you look at our status, because of the armistice, uh, we uh, cannot travel to North Korea. We need government authorization. It's not like uh, we have a border with another country. We cannot issue visas and we cannot travel. So I believe that it will be very difficult to quote unquote normalize uh, inter-Korean relations. I think that the two Koreas need uh, to acknowledge uh, 
uh, the legitimacy with that, uh, unless we do that, uh, the relationship itself stipulates that one party has to uh, do away uh, with the other side. So uh, this goes both ways. So the two sides, uh, unless uh, they acknowledge the legitimacy of the other, uh, we will always uh, be on the other side. Uh, we will always be a party that needs to be eradicated. So I think that uh, these are some of the points uh, that we need to keep in mind, uh, even with uh, denuclearization and also in future agreements uh, with the North. And uh, due to time limits, I will only uh, share one more uh, thought. Uh, Dr. Park talked about how North Korea's much change and uh, uh, we need time uh, for North Korea to change. We need to acknowledge it as a country and we need to induce it so that it can change voluntarily and this is needed for normalization of relations. But uh, I agree with it, but at the same time, I think that we need to think through this through. Once again, you talked about East and West Germany. Uh, um, I think that realistically speaking, the relationship between East and West Germany and the two Koreas is uh, very different. We may think of uh, signing a treaty with North Korea, uh, but I think uh, that it could lead to unification uh, becoming more uh, unattainable. And uh, we have a history of uh, war. I'm not quite sure North Korea will change voluntarily and acknowledge uh, South uh, Korean government. I think when it comes to a competition of legitimacy, usually parties fight till the end because it's an abnormal uh, structure. So I think the fastest way uh, forward is uh, to change the armistice uh, into a peace uh, agreement. So we need a change at the more broader level first. I think we are at that juncture. And uh, I hope that we can further discuss uh, this uh, point later. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Next, uh, Professor Wilson. He will be uh, speaking in English, so please set your receivers on channel 3 for Korean. And for foreigners, you can just listen to the professor speaking. Now the floor is yours, Professor Wilson. It's an honor to be here on a panel with everybody else uh, that has already spoken. Uh, they've been very eloquent and detailed in things they said about the joint declaration. It's always uh, dangerous to be last speaker, especially when so many smart uh, gentlemen has already spoke first, but I'll do my best to keep it uh, quick. So I want to focus not on the statement, the joint statement, but what happened before and after that and compare it to now, and then look at some recommendations for it if I have time. At, at that time, of course, it was the, the height of the Vietnam War. The Vietnam, the Vietnam War was starting to go bad for the United States. We know that the, not just the South Korean military, but the North Korean military was also involved in Vietnam. We know that uh, the President of the United States was reaching out to China to try to end the Vietnam War. We also know that North Korea saw the irregular warfare uh, in going on in Vietnam and looked at it as a means to, to move toward South Korea and vice versa. South Korea did the same thing. So before the declaration, 1968 forward, there was many incidents. We had the commando raid on the Blue House. We had the Pueblo that was uh, seized by North Korea. We had infiltrations in Kangwondo, and many, many other incidents that happened. The, the, the intent was, of course, to weaken the U.S.-South Korean alliance uh, with the weakness that the U.S. alliance was in South Korea because of the Vietnam War. That didn't happen, though. After the, event, after the signing, the declaration signing, of course, uh, later on we saw that there wasn't a lot of difference, except the United States, President Carter, again, wanted to withdraw forces from South Korea. We also know that later on he decided to pull out nuclear weapons uh, from the, the Korean Peninsula, as reported in the news. And, of course, North Koreans were developing nuclear weapons at that time as well. So things were still happening as normal. If, 
if we look at now, though, we see some similarities, which could be dangerous if we don't handle it correctly. We, we have another war going on right now in Ukraine. We have a new alliance between China, or strength alliance between China, Russia, and North Korea. We have a perceived weakness in the alliance, U.S. and South Korean alliance, because of COVID, the lack of training that's taken place, many other things going on, and of course, weapons transfer to the Ukrainian armed forces. So that is indeed dangerous. Uh, however, I think that there's some things we can do to mitigate that and still come about engaging with North Korea. Uh, first of all, the, uh, our efforts should be more preventive in nature. For example, preventive is a word that means being proactive and preventive. And our engagement isn't necessarily in that order. We engage at the top level only. We need to do more bottom-up engagement with North, uh, North Korea, similar to how the United States did, particularly with the Russia and the Soviet, former Soviet Union in the 1960s through the Fulbright program, for example. That gets the people involved, and therefore, uh, as we talked about earlier, instead of having secrecy, we have more engagement in that level. The, so that's very important. We can also, we need to think about regional and state leadership. South Korea has a much larger role in leadership to play and engage in North Korea. And the region does as well, democracies in the region. So South Korea and, United, and Japan, for example, has to, to move on from the historical conflicts they have together and start to work together for more security for the region itself without the United States. Uh, also, when we talk about engagement, we have to think about um, the dating again. So North and South Korea, they don't know one another anymore because of this hostility between them. We have to start to date and do these engagements a little bit at a time in order to start to engage with North Korea. Uh, but just like tango, to, it takes two people to dance. You have to have one person having the lead in that. And I don't think North Korea is going to take the leadership in dancing. But I think that South Korea has a leadership role to do in that. But it has to be done uh, in a complex, dynamic way in order to reach out to the North Korean people, uh, not just the government. At the end of the day, we know that uh, we cannot affect change in the North Korea. It's going to have to be the North Koreans that affect change on their own government. And I believe it can happen today. Uh, so those are some of the major things. I have probably about 15 things to talk about. But I think that we need to transcend the difference is look at the past as a, not just a, a fear for the future, but a path to move things in the right direction for the future. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wilson. Uh, we will now open the floor for questions. Uh, we also can receive uh, questions uh, from our online participants. So we actually do not have a lot of time, so I think we can entertain maybe two questions. If you raise your hand, uh, we will hand you uh, a mic. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and uh, please introduce yourself and also please state who your question is directed to. And uh, due to time constraints, please try to keep your questions concise. I don't think we have any questions uh, from uh, online participants. I think that we are actually running out of time, so if uh, you don't have any questions, uh, we can just uh, invite our two presenters uh, for their final comments, and then we can uh, conclude this session. So I would like to first invite uh, Professor Che Bosan and then Dr. Park uh, for your final comments. Uh, then, Dr. Park, uh, you can go first, and then uh, we will invite uh, Professor Chen. So, uh, Professor Wilson um, briefly gave us his comment about uh, the international background of the July 4th statement. And I very much agree with uh, Professor Wilson. And he talked about uh, Korea uh, also being engaged and taking a proactive role. Yes, I believe that we need to take a proactive and preventive role as well. 
동의를 하면서 I do agree with your suggestion. And but when it comes to the engagement, how are we going to engage? So engagement is not embracement. I just want to clarify that one more time. When engaging uh, the DPRK, of course, we need to be uh, preemptive and. When engaging the regime, as uh, Dr. Lee mentioned, of course, uh, I actually talked about that in many columns that um, I wrote, but whenever uh, the DPRK violates agreements and commitments, then we need to take action. That is engagement. If you break the commitment, what happens? then the relationship between two countries will go bad and we need to apply that same principle. So uh, we need to do it right this time. And uh, Dr. Lee Gang Woo talked about strategies and my 25-page long on deck includes those suggestions. The 2048 plan for unification should be devised, I think. And of course, the inter-Korean relations um, is very much different from that of the two Germanys, but we need to recognize each other as sovereign states. To date, um, we were not able to do so. And Kim Yo-jong said, let's just leave each other alone. And I believe that was the true intention of the DPRK. And for the past 30 years, the DPRK actually pursued a two-chosen uh, approach. But after um, they built their nuclear arsenal, uh, they became more offensive. Anyway, um, they want us to leave them alone. And in that sense, uh, we need to learn much from the basic treaty of the two Germanys. And if we were to discuss the revision of the Constitution, then, yes, the um, entire Korean Peninsula uh, is the territory of the two Koreas. However, we also need to uh, restrict the jurisdiction of the North and South. And a lot of people talk about uh, agreement um, by the people, and the government also uh, focuses on that. Um, a committee on unification, on the consolidation of the people uh, existed every single time, uh, despite the changes of administration. However, when pursuing um, policy toward North Korea, if the other party um, rules, then we tend to reject what they offer. Then how can we reach consensus at the national level? We cannot. So we need to respect the other parties offer as well. And when it comes to inter-Korean relations and policy toward North Korea, let's not just say the word that we um, care about the agreement of the people. Instead of doing so, Let's focus on what we can do in reality. So that's what I want to say today. Thank you. At the end of the day, I think this is our destiny. Uh, as we live on the Korean Peninsula, this is our destiny. And I think we need to remember one thing. 
This peninsula has been separated for 70 years and South Korea in terms of human rights, in terms of economy, uh, has uh, moved further. And I think that we have uh, the legitimacy uh, and uh, we are a central party to uh, this uh, nation. So as uh, the uh, leading party of uh, the situation, we need to embrace uh, North Korea. We need to come up uh, with uh, policies uh, that can embrace uh, North Korea at the end. So uh, we might be not be happy with North Korea, but I think that it is uh, our destiny uh, to uh, be able to encompass uh, uh, the North as well. And the second point that I want to raise is that uh, the party that manages and operates uh, North Korea uh, is uh, South Korea. But I think we need to be aware of the military strength of uh, North Korea. Uh, we need a very strong stance uh, when it comes to security threats. Uh, we need to enhance our capabilities to respond. Uh, we cannot base all our actions based on the intentions of North Korea. We need an objective uh, evaluation of North Korea's uh, capability. And the fact of the matter is uh, North Korea has uh, nuclear weapons and it has missiles. So based on that, uh, we need to build a very strong uh, defense posture that can respond uh, to a uh, substantial North Korean nuclear threat. Uh, I did uh, make some criticism regarding the uh, statement, but I want to state that uh, despite what went on in the past 50 years, I believe that South Korea has the resources uh, to actually implement what has been agreed so far. So I think uh, we can just uh, do our best. And if we don't make that step, then uh, nothing uh, will ever be implemented. And uh, ultimately, North Korea may shift their paradigm. South Korea really does not have any paradigm to shift. Uh, we have our constitutional value, demo democratic value, and uh, our human rights. The question is when North Korea will make a uh, shift uh, toward uh, democracy. Uh, we also need to think about how we are going to support uh, North Korea with our resources when that time comes. And I think that uh, because we are a party of uh, the legitimacy that is bestowed upon the people of the Korean Peninsula, we have that responsibility. Thank you very much. Uh, today in this session, we took a look at uh, the July 4th inter-Korean joint statement. Uh, we took a look at uh, the meaning of the statement uh, on the 50th anniversary of uh, the statement. And in closing, as moderator, I would like to offer some closing comments. Uh, when the joint statement uh, was announced, uh, the international community was going through a lot of change too. As mentioned earlier, uh, there was detente among uh, the U.S. and China, and uh, uh, there was a uh, separation in uh, Germany, and at the time, a basic treaty was uh, signed, and uh, Vietnam was pursuing unification through war, and also in Yemen in 1972, there was a summit that was held uh, that uh, agreed uh, to unify in 1973. So if you look back, uh, in 1972 was a very important 
year for all countries that were separated at the time. In 1975, uh, Vietnam uh, was uh, unified by force, and in uh, 1989, 1990, Germany was uh, unified peacefully, and Yemen in 1990 was uh, unified, but then after a lot of conflict, was separated in 1994, and then North Yemen uh, by force unified with uh, South Yemen afterwards. So in Korea, the separation has lasted for seven years, and uh, Germany has been reunified for 32 years. It just seems like yesterday that German was uh, reunified, and I was also surprised that the uh, joint statement uh, was announced when I was in high school. So it just seems like yesterday, but so much time has passed. So I think that for Korea, we have a long way ahead of us. Uh, despite this, uh, sometimes the latecomer can uh, get ahead. So. Uh, I think we need to accept our destiny and uh, we cannot give up on uh, unification. I think we can simply think about ways uh, that we can achieve this in a more wiser way and through agreement uh, with North Korea. Uh, Dr. Park mentioned the 2048 plan, but uh, perhaps it will take uh, longer. Perhaps uh, we can unify sooner, and at the end of the day, this is the responsibility uh, of the people, of uh, the government officials and politicians of uh, Korea. With that, uh, I would like to conclude this session on the evaluation and meaning of the 50th anniversary of the July 4th Inter-Korean Joint Statement. Thank you very much, presenters and discussants.